It's motherfucking bold and Brefix. The podcast. Kaz Nagahama, welcome back to the Bowl and Brefix universe, my friend. Long time no see. Long time no see. It's like five years ago or more. Well, we have to skip the pandemic time, so it was two years. So way before you moved back to the East Coast, I guess. Yeah, I moved back to the East Coast. Literally, it became 2020 when I was on my train back to the East Coast. So, oh, I see. Yeah, so the the ball dropped not long after I got back. But, um, Kaz, let's let's get started on like where where can people find you on the internet? Where can people find what you uh, what you do? Well, I guess <laughs> I don't know, but I do a lot of things. I guess last. 20 something years on in Hollywood. Uh, most of people know me from the old comedy live show, Tim and Eric. That was a long time ago. And I did a lot of guest star for How I Met Your Mothers, the TV show, and The Basket with Zach Ganapakis, and uh, a lot of indie films. You know, and then I did a lot of podcasts with you, like, you know, artists. So I'm all around, but I don't think people would know who I am. But if they search my name, Kazi Nagahama, probably they might find somewhere that they might have known me. Um, and I, I changed my look now. It's all white. Yeah, so that's like, new. Yeah, I stopped dyeing my hair <clears throat> during the pandemic. I said, you know what? I, I don't want to. I want to be natural. Yeah, just embrace it, man. You look great. You're a silver fox now. Silver fox? <laughs> yeah, you're a silver yeah, It's fox. not anymore salt and pepper. It doesn't look like salt and pepper. It's like a silver fox. Yeah, you're a, pure, you're a purely silver fox now. I love it. So you were dyeing your hair when you were on Bowl and Brefix. Yeah. Uh, wow. I think it was really, I think dyeing your hair by yourself is very dangerous because I, I think you have to be careful with what kind of chemical you're using for your hair, right? Yeah, I mean, I, that... I actually just bleached my roots yesterday. <laughs> so, like, I don't know. I kind of just been. Uh... I heard that uh, bleaching your hair is best is a beer. <laughs> a beer, you just dump your hair into the beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've heard that too. Like the something about the the yeast or whatever. Yeah. Now, but so, I go I go for those pure um, chemicals. The natural thing. The strongest chemicals that I can find, straight to the blood brain barrier. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll we'll get into your your body of work where people can recognize you, but uh, you were a really integral part of Bowl and Brefix, um, the show back in the day. Um, for all you young kids that just got into this podcast as a podcast, yeah. little might you know that Bowl and Brefix is the name of an interview show that was created in Los Angeles in 2016 and 17 by right. yours truly of the same name. And uh, Kaz was a producer. You were you were producer and you had your own sketch. That's right. Um, you had your own recurring sketch well, called Casual, casual, casual Time. Talk, time? <laughs> yeah, casual Time. Yeah. So tell us tell us about Casual Time. What what was it? Well, I guess I we shot only one or two episodes, but it, I don't think it came out um, much in the public. But I still have a footage because you remember the camera guy Adam, um, Adam. Yeah, Adam Bennett. That's my that's yeah, my boy. Shout box out to Adam Born studio. Bennett. Yeah, Adam Born, and uh, he gave me a short footage, but uh, it was a random thing. But I think I wanted to try that reading odd script or whatever people are posting on Craig Race at that time. And I just leave a strange comment, whatever I think. 
I think that was kind of interesting segment. Chris, can you put in a little short clip of Casual Time? Casual Time is a fun new segment uh, starring Kazu Nagahama that's going to be put in right now. Hello, everybody. This is Casual Time. I want to enjoy my story that I studied a long time. It starts like this. Talented pussy, the boar seeking an equally talented play partner. I have always been great at giving head. It's something I thought about a lot when I was a horny teenager. And the moment I ate my first pussy, I knew I was a pro. I've made women light, hate it. I know I'm good at what I do, but what about you? So casual time was you in a robe, sitting by a green screen fireplace and reading casual encounter posts from Craigslist. And it was uh, it's pretty amazing hearing you read, you know, the things that people were <laughs> like these. And I had a, I had my dog on the lap at that time, too, this dog, Jack. Yep, Jack, right. who is now blind. Yeah, I remember I did a two segment at the casual time talk. I kept eating the jalapeno or whatever it is. It was something strange, odd stuff. Also, I had a talk about uh, people really posting on the Craigslist saying that one lady wanted to get pregnant, but she didn't want to marry or whatever relationship, that kind of odd, real, real posting on the Craigslist. So I was yeah. talking about that. Yeah. And I remember when uh, one of them was like a guy just like looking for sex and he was talking about yeah. his different skills that he has pretty disturbing and just just the juxtaposition of you sitting by a fireplace like in this cozy robe and you're reading these weird things that people say mm -hmm. it was something else um but yeah that was great you had your own episode on bowl and Brefix, and then you had your own sketch and i actually saw in uh googling your name that a thumbnail from casual time is your IMDB photo. Oh yeah? Yeah, it like comes up as uh, the oh, search result of your IMDB profile. So that was, that's an honor. You know, there are many crazy people following me and they post a lot of strange picture of me on IMDB or other websites. So Sometimes I have to check my name, you know, on and off because they, people pass really strange things. <laughs> so I have they to control do that. my media publicity. <laughs> they do. They do be posting strange things on the internet. So you are doing this podcast at the same form as you you used to. Do. Well, before we are in the, we had a green back screen, right? And then you yeah. had a. Oh yes. crap! My backdrop fell. One moment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can't be oh, having be that. Be careful with the pin. Stay right there, Mister. Um. Well, yeah. Bowl and Brefix was an interview show, not quite a podcast. It was filmed in a really nice studio in Los Angeles, Drone Box Studios. Yeah, Drone Box rest in peace um and yeah it was much more absurd like it was it was uh very very absurd there was a i had a clown guest host who was invisible to myself and the guests like all the guests were instructed i'm sure you remember to completely ignore this clown and that he would try to fuck yeah. with you and distract you and like other stuff would be edited in, but um, yeah, this is kind of like the the grown up, mature yeah. version of Bowl and Brefix. 
more of a a podcast. Well, that studio is very professionally made, but it's gone now, so it's gone forever. Yeah, but it was amazing. I mean, when I when I showed up to LA the first time I moved there in 2016, uh, my friend. Um, Frank Tartaglia, who um, recently passed, he picked me up from Union Station because I had taken the train out there. And he said, so I know you want to make an interview show. And my friend wants to make your interview show. He wants to make it at his studio. And I was like, oh, cool. Yeah, like, let's do it. Thinking that, you know, it's going to be some thrown together thing, just like in someone's basement or whatever. And I arrived to Dronebox the first time to film, and it's this gorgeous, extremely professional studio. And I was like, holy yeah. shit. This is crazy. Well, I, I was on your show, too. But also, I happen to know many other actors or artists there. Because uh, you, you remember Adam Papagan? He's, he's been a long time my friends, too. But also, he used to work for uh, Tim and Eric's show. So I used to know him from the set. And also Chris Dodson, I invited him to be part of your show, but also, you know, he was on other shows that was me for Drumbox Studio, but also BJ. Yeah, BJ. BJ, and Chris, I, they were all guests on my show. Adam Papagan was also on my, on, on Bowling Yeah, Netflix. BJ used to be with my show partner in acting. I used to make a pilot a long time ago, and they happened to know that he was there at the drone box. So, so I had a reunion too. So it was a really interesting time. It was always something happening at that studio. It was very, very energetic. You know, I, I could feel the creativity. That's why I used to hop in and then show up. And uh, we used to, you know, get together there. Yeah, it was a super cool spot. Shout out to Nolan and Louis Silverstein. I mean, yeah, they uh, that was it was really a cool hub, and uh, it's a shame that it's no longer functioning. Do you know what happened to the studio? Yeah, I think everybody started kind of falling apart. I think they started pointing out each other, saying, "Oh, you're using me, or you're not really doing much yet," you know, blah blah blah. So everything started falling apart. I guess it's more personal drama. I, I didn't want to deal with that. So I, I wasn't there. So according to other people involved, they are, they got nasty. <laughs> so it's a personal drama. And also Nolan, I think he wanted a, I think Nolan and his uh, partner brother for the studio, they rented the whole building. And they com- converted to the per- professional studio. I guess they wanted to back off, so they they didn't want to be there anymore. So I think that's the way it is. They live in Malibu. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. I mean, well, sucks that that happens sometimes. But look, I'm I'm grateful that I was able to be a yeah. part of it in that kind of golden age where just so many cool things were coming out of that studio. But you're, you're, some of the friends are still in LA, right? That guy, you had a really interesting guest. I remember, I don't want to want to mention some others, but you know, the guy who, who has so interesting, dramatic costume all over. I don't know, he, he's a dancer or costume designer or whatever it is. I think there's a few people that could qualify. Probably Ernie Omega. I've yeah. Heard Ernie Omega on my show. He's a cool guy. Yeah, very cool. I think he has his own shop now in in Melrose District somewhere. Wow. Yeah, I, I follow him on Instagram. He's a very interesting guy. Super cool. Yeah, very like club kid type legendary. Yeah, Outer space looking. <laughs> yeah, Ernie Omega, uh, Vinny O was also on my show. Yeah. Vinny O is uh, conver- like converting themselves uh-huh. into a, an alien. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. 
Yeah, I had some really, is he uh, I had some professional really awesome model? people. What? Is he a professional model or something? Probably. Fashion, fashion model? model? That would make because sense. Because he looks like something. <laughs> <laughs> something. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was really blessed to have those people on. Um, so how did you, how did you uh, get your start in acting? Like, did you, yeah, tell me about, tell me about how you started out. Got into acting? Yeah. Well, I was already acting when I was in Japan growing up. Uh, I And I had to make a living when I was a kid because my grandfather who raised me, he died when I was 12 years old. So I, ha I was technically on my own from since then. So then I had a <clears throat> kind of a chance to work for a comedy club for Kabuki theater too. So I was kind of getting into it. I was getting paid for it. Then I had to pay my tuition for high school and higher education, right? So I was studying daytime. Nighttime, I go to the theater. I work comedy a bit. I get, you know, some cash and whatever it is, tip. I was doing the whole time. But then when I moved to Los Angeles, I was taking a break from acting for a while, but old friend of mine who started off making a lot of movies for Hollywood, you know, like the Japanese movies, uh, Memo of Geisha, uh, Last Samurai, those kind of times, the two, early 2000s, I think. Uh, yeah, I think both of those movies five. came out in the early 2000s, right? Yeah, so then I started getting back into the acting, whatever I can grab. And I, I didn't have any problem getting into it. But I had to go to some auditions and crazy things. And one of the crazy things was uh, Tim and Eric because I had no idea who they were because they were not in Hollywood, you know? But, you know, I I, I talked to Dave Nivon, whatever. He was executive producer at that time. And they, they, were, they had a really small studio off San, Santa Monica Boulevard across the street from, uh, <clears throat> I think, the Hollywood Cemetery, Forever Cemetery, little tiny studio. That's how Tim and Eric started for the Adult Swim Cartoon Network. And I, I was just one of the characters. They just uh, wanted to use my cameo or whatever it is. And I, they took off. The show took off. So that was interesting way to look at it now but at that time i was like well i don't know this kind of strange comedy show i didn't want to even call what it is and now you know your generation or yeah your generation a little older generation they started following crazy that show yeah they're extremely influential i was in it with um with that guy strange guy but he he died uh, Richard Pepe, Dunn Pepe. Richard Dunn yeah. yeah Richard Dunn and also David Liverhurt yeah uh, David Liverhurt was in your show too uh, yeah he's been in my live show James Quall yeah and all others have you but I was you... like wow they're not really qualified actors <laughs> <laughs> they were like from somewhere on the street yeah well you know but they're paying me to do something a bit, even though I didn't have to speak some of the part. But they made my segment, Kaz Kiss or Kajua Sword and other <laughs> Kaz. How did they find um, you? Like, how did you get hooked up with Tim and Eric? Well, that was, a. Uh, I think other actors, I think they found from the street some of the recommendations from somebody. But I went to the interview with a producer, Dave Nebo and... Uh, uh, one of the producer, he became really close to me, uh, Clark Mankin and others. So I went to the formal way to get into that show, but I don't know any other people because they look like uh, they're from the mental hospitals. <laughs> but uh, I had to act with them. They're screaming on the set. There is no script, you know. But that was an interesting way. <laughs> that I've never experienced on the set. 
Yeah, I've wondered quite a bit how how they source their actors because it does it really seems like they kind of go to central casting and just kind of find the weirdest people that they can. Yeah, I I don't know how they cast it, well, including me, but uh, somehow they found those talents. <laughs> and uh, I think that's that was new at that time. Um, now you see so many shows like Eric Andre shows. And Eric Andre, I remember, I was talking to some other actors, you know, I, we know long time Eric Andre. I don't think I should talk about too much about Eric Andre, but I know when Eric Andre came to Los Angeles, Hollywood started doing stand up. We were always at the comedy stores, or, you know, comedy clubs. So I was watching Eric Andre. He was not like whatever he is doing on the Eric Andre show. I don't know how how they he ended up like doing that kind of crazy show, but he was really normal kid. So I'm looking at now Eric Andre. Well, Eric Andre show is produced by the same production of Tim and Eric anyway. So yeah, Tim and Eric um, produce that. Yeah, Tao Sakurai, the Japanese American, you know, uh, guy. He's a director for that show. And he work, used to work for the Tim and Eric show too. Um, so, and uh, I remember a lot of people came out of that production, I was in Cartoon Network, Tim and Eric show. They became, a lot of them became famous behind the scene in Hollywood now. So I got a lot of casting call directly from director. Uh, who's that? Uh, he won the Emmy for the Portlandia. Um, Fred Armisen? Uh, yeah. And also he did the show Basket with Zach Kanapakis. He was director for that basket to FX. And he called me. He tried to find me where I am. So he said, Katz, can you do this uh, simple one role for his TV show? And I was so impressed by his approach because he remembered me. And then when I went to the sh uh, <clears throat> shooting on the set, he introduced everybody and said, Hey, this is the cast. I used to do the Tim and Eric and then, you know, this blah, blah, blah. So that, that was very interesting experience. So would you say that Tim and Eric was kind of like your big break? Because it seems like a lot of stuff came from your experience on Tim and Eric? Well, I think they are doing whatever they are there they want to do now. I think it seems like they are I mean Eric loves eating food and wine, so I guess he's doing his own production, right? He published a book, cooking book, he likes to travel. He's a food critic now. Yeah. And the, Tim I think he, he's married and he has kids and he, he has own, own life. And he does a lot of random film appearance now. And also he loves, I guess, I guess music, music thing. So yeah, he's, he's been touring tour. with a band and doing some stand up and he has a podcast as well. Yeah. A podcast too with, uh, with, uh, what's that? You know him. Uh, With uh, Doug Pound and Vic, guy, yeah. 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 Vic Berger. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're great office hours. Um, well, Tim is the same age as me, so. Really? And he's doing amazing, I guess. You guys are the same age? Same age. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. So, tell me, about, tell me about Kaz Kiss. Kaz Kiss? <laughs> I... I think that uh, randomly they were shooting, well, shooting the episode for different, different, you know, episode for the Tim and Eric. I think they found my natural reaction was interesting and funny. So they started collecting those Tim's moment and then everybody said, scream, Kaz Kiss out of blue when we are shooting the episode, every episode. I think they collected all random reaction when Tim kisses me. You know, the lips were <laughs> that was disgusting. But uh, they made it, it for a special feature for 
for, I guess, uh, season two DVD, whatever it is, coming out. So they made a special feature, whatever it is. And, and the season three, they made the casual sorting. Yeah. Tell me about they casual sorting. They made an episode for me, but it was deleted. But they still included my scene for episode for the season three DVD too. So I, I think I was lucky that Tim and Eric liked me, not the way they treated uh, David Liverhurt. <laughs> so Tim and Eric really did really gave me a nice treatment. I never had any bad experience that they they never did anything mean to me. So. I appreciate, um, yeah, their support. Well, you know, all the love to David Liebehart. Uh, but yeah, having worked with him myself, he's not, well, like he was he's so not the easiest to person to work anyway. with. Yeah, it's impossible to work with him. <laughs> well, I hope he's doing well and I send him much love. Yeah, he yeah, yeah. was not the easiest man to work with. <laughs> But um, yeah, the only thing I remember, I, I remember vaguely a clip of Casual Sword in. I feel like you were trying to open a doorknob with a sword. Yeah, that's right. I think they used that part for, I don't know which season the episode, but they used for, it's called a, the, the universe. They used that opening scene. But they had, I had a more footage than just opening the door. But uh, they use that only scene to open the door to to get into the universe, whatever it is. Right, universe, right. universe, so. And then Tim and Eric, you you know, was talking about scientific universal whatever talk afterwards. That was opening for that episode. I remember. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, how was it working with Zach Galifianakis on Baskets? You know he. He's a great actor, you know, he's a professional trained. But I think he, I see his personality is very private and very uh, isolated himself. And uh, when I worked with him, well, oh, he was on Tim and Eric too, remember? Quite a bit, yeah. Yeah, so Zach remember me because I have a really thick eye blow. And he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. He was, he kept looking at my face saying, you have really nice hair on your face. I say, you have a really hairy body because he's a Greek, you know? Yeah. So he said, oh yeah. All right. then, then, you know, we had a really acting together. And it was, it was, it was, it was interesting, natural. But we didn't shoot too many times because, uh, we didn't make a mistake. So we just, we just shot. Two hours. But that show is canceled too. So the, that was an interesting TV show. Yeah, it was about, he was a clown, right? Yeah, clown. Yeah. And the main character, his mother was the famous stand up comedy actor, happened to be transvestite or, or transgender. I don't remember if, if he changed his real sexuality. Sexual orientation, or not, but he was she in the TV show. Louis Anderson, maybe right? Actual life. Yeah, Anderson. Yeah, Louis Anderson. Yeah. Cool. Well, <laughs> we we've talked about this on Bull and Brefix years ago, but uh, you've mentioned <laughs> we had a series of telephone conversations leading up to your time on Bull and Brefix. And uh, you used to tell me that you enjoyed torturing people. What? You used to tell me that you enjoyed torturing people. Torturing people, yeah. Well, tell me not... about that. What's well, up with that? it's interesting because, you know, if you, I think people know that the movie is called, uh, Silence of Lamb or uh, those intellectual torture, well, not necessarily physically, but uh, 
I like to see the people how they react when I get into their real soul and personality, you know. Because torture is not basically the same thing to to the I think I, I think the torture should be totally treated as different personality wise. Because for example, I'm looking at you, I see you, and I get into your life and you have a weak spot, right? Right. You don't want to be mentioned, but still people, you know, feel the pain. But it's not necessary mean way, but I like to see the real personality of the people, how they react. And that's my torture, what I mean. Uh, but it could be mean, but, you know, that's a part of acting too. Because you look at yourself, I look at myself, right? But if you really understand emotion and the personality yourself, it's actually interesting way to bring your real unwakened acting character. You know, I'm challenging myself and you're challenging yourself. I think that then you can expand the ability to become something that you are trying to get into. So my torture meaning is I like to expand my ability of understanding of others and I enjoy looking at how people react to it. So, well, sometimes in a sexual fetish way too, but not most of the time. Hilarious. Well, hey, I couldn't have said it better myself. I think some people might call that sociopathy, but... <laughs> what? <laughs> Being a being a sociopath, anti antisocial personality disorder, but uh, I think most of people are sociopaths. Really? Yeah, I think so because you look at the teacher or nurse or doctors, they feel the satisfaction in the way they're helping, right? Right. But also they get the reward and then, you know compensation to live in the society. But they're not aggressive enough to grab the money from the people like other business people. So those kind nature, you know, people, they are mostly sociopaths. I mean, I don't want to say crazy way, but uh, there are people who need to be fit into the society as work. You know, those people can be sociopaths, teacher, priest, uh, nurse, right? Yeah. They're good at it. Yeah, I mean sometimes uh when you least where you least expect it, people are kind of secretly um manipulating and, and yeah. yeah, I think you touched on like we we're all out for survival, right? Like when mm -hmm. when you have an ego you have a body that you need to keep alive. You have a self that you, you know, you have this idea that you have to f keep yourself alive. And sometimes that gives rise to, mm -hmm. you know, you feel like you have to manipulate people or get what you need in some way. And yeah, we could really get into how, you know, doctors, will try to get you on certain medications so they can you know yeah. make money from the whatever i don't know i don't know enough about i i think that most of the people are not crazy sociopaths either you know we don't even call them sociopaths but a real sociopath you know they are crazy they are manipulating people but also they don't think they're doing the wrong thing but they have two different sides but they know how to manipulate people. Sometimes they are stabbing from the back, in the back, but they are pretending like, oh, no, 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 I'm helping you. But in the way, the other side, they're talking about really bad thing about you and they're trying to manipulate, you know? It, it's, I've seen so many people like that, especially in Hollywood, you know? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a very dark world. They're dark, <laughs> yes. Yeah. You you talked to me about this before. Um, 
but I think it's worth bringing on to the podcast. You, there was a Japanese serial killer. Oh, who would eat folks? Yeah. Did you you, you play him in a movie? Cannibal. Yeah. Did you play him no, in a movie? Well, he just passed away a couple of years ago. I happened to uh, had a chance to meet him one or twice, you know, in, in Tokyo. Well, I think when you Google this cannibalism uh, happened in France a long time ago. His name is Sagawa, something. And he was a student at the uh, university in France, Paris. And then he, I think he killed I don't know the white white girl, but anyway, blonde hair. He was a fetish about it. He really dream about, really loved that girl, and with his crazy love, he wanted to eat her. So he killed and he ate. They found him. Uh, he kept the head in the refrigerator. And they, they found out he ate some of the body parts, but they didn't want to throw into uh, throwing him into the jail because they claimed that he was insane. So he was taken back to Japan without any charges. And he lived until a long time ago. And uh, he wrote the book. He looked like a normal guy, but uh, he was, you know, cuckoo. But he was a very, very brilliant person. He's from really wealthy family from Tokyo. And somehow, interesting way that he he dream about eating the people but, but i don't I mean think what 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 what, yeah. what more uh, pure expression of love could you find than like you know this person literally wants to consume me well i think people have a, a fantasy in the head right and then always make people making joke oh she's so cute i want to eat her you know but it, it's a joke right but if people exceed the real, real meaning of literally speaking, they want to eat. Like, no, but no, I, I actually want to barbecue her flesh and put some nice yeah. sauce on it yeah. and actually consume. Is this the same it. guy? Is this the same guy um, as the uh, otaku murderer? Or is that a different guy? No, well, he's not like well, he was a nerd too, but he's I, I don't think it's the same person that you're talking about. Still, he was a nerd. He loved those uh, beautiful girl, especially blonde girl, whatever it is. And he, he really got into the beauty of the women, but he looked really not ugly, but he was not attractive to the women. So then he had a complex. So how he's gonna get the beautiful girl in his real life? But he wanted, really wanted, then he got into the crazy, insane action of killing and eating uh, life. But he was very talented. How did... Smart guy. Hold on, what's yeah. happening? You there? What happened? <laughs> I don't know. I thought my computer was about to explode. Um, how did you meet him? No, he was. A, he was. I mean, he was just like he, a guy. He had a little like show. He was. He had a little like a talk show, whatever. It is. He was kind of famous, so we know that where he's gonna be at the bar. He has a little interview like this. He wrote a book. So I, I was interested in seeing him. So, you know, I purchased the tickets and, you know, I happened to be there. Afterwards, he was always talking with the people, but, you know, he was already famous guy like that. He was like, kind of nerdish. Looks like your signal might have gone out. That's all right. Um, I, I think your computer is kind of acting weird. Is it? It stops sometimes, it moves sometimes. 
That's all right. As long as we stay on, we're good. Um, wow, interesting. So he just kind of like killed this woman, ate her, got off for cause of insanity, and just proceeded to live a normal, successful life. Well, then he um, well, I think at the end I I heard that he became parano paranoid. And also he became like a schizophrenia. Sure. But um I think he he was just trying to make a living barely and his family was all a long time gone. So even though his family was very famous, wealthy family, but at the end he died broke, I'm sure. Alone. Uh, but still he he had an interesting life, so people were interested in him. But at the end he became a little kind of isolated himself from the society. But he, yeah. Well, yeah, I can't imagine that a person that would be capable of cannibalism and murder would uh, turn out to be a sweet, wholesome guy (laughs) who goes to, you know, church on Sunday. I think he's the only one person got away from the crime. Most of people, they, you know, serious killers, they ate the body, right? Body parts. They're in jail. But he is only one somehow got away from the crime. He should be, well, he went to mental hospital actually, but he was released in Tokyo. So, but he never, uh, got into the prison for the crime he committed. That was interesting. And he never killed anybody afterwards. So, speaking of crime, and uh, please feel free to, we'll, we'll uh, slice this out if you don't want to talk about this, but I think we've talked about it on Bowling Graphics briefly. Um, is it your father that was a part of the Yakuza? Who, my father? Yeah. Well, my father was, well, he passed away, I think. 2017. Well, he, well, to be honest, he was not really Yakuza Yakuza. He was not, he, he was smart, but he had so many Yakuza friends, but also I remember one of his best friend was, I used to call my uncle, and he was a real Yakuza in Susuke, you know, you know, it's like a, a gang mafia. And uh, actually, he was shot to death so many times. And I got the, <clears throat> his a memoir. It was an old bloody lizard jacket. And I said, who's going to wear this kind of bullet hole and a whole bloody jacket? So my father said, well, this is the only thing he was wearing at the end. He was shot to death. So he wanted to give it to you. I said, I, I don't think so. <laughs> wow. So my my father was dealing with all the yakuza. Well, he could be a business yakuza, but he was not violent yakuza. But he knew all the people working with. So he was a pretty successful businessman. My my father was. So I knew yakuza all along, uh, but I never got into their business. My father told me never never go into the yakuza business because. Yakuza is a very difficult job now in Japan because if you are once part of Yakuza, everything you can, you, you, you're going to do, social security is going to be canceled and you, you are 24 seven monitored by police. Your kids is going to be special, specially labeled at school. So socially, publicly, if a Yakuza, they're trying to just demeaning people when they're in the, in the gang. So it's a very difficult life for them now. Uh, and there are, you know, they can, whatever they, they can go out of the country, actually. Their passport doesn't work. Their, their passport wouldn't work. They can go to Hawaii. They're going to be. Forever FBI uh, list to Japan, Japanese government is going to tell there are the 
they are the Yakuza family, so you can you can accept them because they are going to danger your country. So they can go to any any country to travel. It, it's very difficult life for them. Crime, don't do the crime. <laughs> you don't if you don't want the time. But Yakuza, I think Yakuza is a good. Well, people look at the Yakuza really dangerous and also uh, bad people, but not necessarily they're bad people because they are always trying to make the society, you know, straight out because they used to be in between. Their job was police wouldn't get into the business uh what do you call those dispute between the company or people yakuza business was they're trying to get into the middle and they're trying to make everything settle i mean they took the money from both sides sometimes they use a the violence sometimes they use different way of the method the police wouldn't get into those things you know between the civilians but the yakuza used to do that they were doing good things, but uh, the way they uh, acted violently was not appreciated in the society because they used you know, illegal guns and bullet holes. Sure. Wow. So tell me about tell me about what it was like to work in the kabuki theaters and such back in back home. Well, kabuki, as you know, that it's a traditional. Uh, like Japanese opera, I would say, you know, you wear the kimono and the costume, makeup, but the kabuki is done by only male now. But originally, kabuki was started like 1500 years ago in Japan, uh, was by female, uh, we call not the witch, but a shaman, you know, like, and the, the women, who could see the kind of like a fortune teller, kind of those kind of people. I mean, they started disguising, you know, all the funny makeup, and they started dancing and telling the people the story. So, so what was what was your role in this world? Um, I, I did that Kabuki theater, I don't know, uh, five or six years in that training. But I wasn't going to Kabuki theater family. You know, it's kind of interesting way that the generation, generation, uh, those actors, clan family, they take over the clan, the important part of the Kabuki theater. So I was born into it. I liked it, but I said, no, it's not for me. I don't want to look like a girl. I don't want to put all the white makeup and then say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, like a girl. I, I didn't like it. So, <laughs> so, so I, I became a comedy, comedy actress in Japan. That's how I ended up comedy acting. But I have a drama acting background too. Yeah. But most of people remember me still now. I guess I'm a comedy actor. But it works. I mean, I appreciate the experience I did with Kabuki Theater. And, uh, everything works for me. Nothing, nothing wasted. Yeah, I'm sure that gave you a really cool background for coming into Hollywood to have that traditional <laughs> experience. I think, you know, Oprah Winfrey said one time, I remember the word. Uh, people call it lucky or luck. It's not just that you are calling magical word luck. It's about you are there right time, right place, right opportunity. So you, if you see that some people grab the opportunity and then they are lucky. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't see the timing. That's what I say. If the Tim and Eric didn't come to the Hollywood, they accepted 
they were ready to accept a new type of comedy at that time. But if they were now, or 50 years ago, they wouldn't be making a big show like Tim and Eric. But they were at the right place, right time, right opportunity. That's what I see all the Hollywood or other artists like you too. They have to know the right time, right opportunity. And they have to create the environment like that, right? No matter what, we have to keep doing it, what we believe. But we don't know how successful it's going to be. Uh, that's, that's the little struggle we have to face. What do you think the secret is to being able to get to that right place at the right time, the right opportunity? Do you think it's like a, a spiritual connection that you have to have? Do you think like it's a certain intuition that you have to be able to, you have to be able to follow your? Well, I, my, my life is, as you know, the art or creativeness or society wise, we cannot be the only one creating any movement or art. We have to know the presence of others. So actually one example, I'm always proactive. And what happened was during the pandemic, it came to realize to me saying that what other my actors friend doing this difficult time? So I started calling them every day. Say, how are you doing? You know, uh, well, we don't know how long it's going to take, uh, you know, this pandemic. And uh, we didn't know when the end of the tunnel was, you know, the end of the pandemic, but I kept calling them. And then I started saying, uh, let's do something. We have opportunity. Actually, we are stuck at home. So let's do something new. Well, but that, that created a new opportunity with the right people. Right time was the wrong time for the pan pandemic, but I took as a right time to get the opportunity to get all the people I used to act together and professional director. I started making a project. So now I have, you know, field project. I started shooting uh since pandemic started so it's like a fourth year now and it's becoming really interesting way that people really uh give us really good feedback you know it's all going all over the film festival now it's called the south pasadena wow um where can where can people find that i think it's on youtube whatever it is but uh it's called a south pasadena and then short film comedy and I we just finished the shooting for the South Pasadena 4 and it's it's getting better and better weird actors you know comedy actor professional comedy actor in Hollywood most of them are my friend a professional director and professional sound everything like that but it's getting better and I'm so happy for it uh, so and then this uh Hollywood you know writers and actors strike happened so I, we ended up shooting before this strike happened. So we are lucky. Now we can't shoot anymore. Uh, but, uh, this is another time that we really need to get united and proactive actually during this strike. So I'm supporting them. I'm part of the union. So I go out to walk every day in this hot summer in front of the studio to demand our needs. Uh, but um, I hope that all the people, they are able to survive during, during this strike because it's so hard. You know, the Hollywood is very difficult to survive. If you don't have any show or acting gig or music gig, whatever it is, you can't have an in income or anything. So it's completely stopped now. I think next three months or four months, maybe whole rest of the year, we won't be able to work. So I hope that everybody survives, not only actors, writers, because 
if you look at the studio, all the sound guy, uh, catering, food guy, and also makeup artist, right? Everybody stop, stops. Right. Working. That's that's a, an unbelievably huge part of the economy of Southern California yeah. is 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 on strike and it's thirty million dollars a day damage every day. Thirty million dollars for the LA. Yeah. <laughs> so it's gonna be four or five billion dollars for this strike. So it's not just a union or studio. Whole economy is gonna collapse if we go on the strike a long time. So at the end, I'm sure the government and LA city, California state. And also many industry people, they would step in to resolve our strike, I'm sure. So studio need to listen to our demand because it's going to be crazy, crazy damage to everybody, not only actors or writers. Whole city is yeah. going to be dead. <laughs> I mean, think of, yeah, think of all the the drivers that get actors That's places right. the the food places that get uh, right. actors going on their lunch break it's it's immeasurable yeah uh disruption to the uh -huh. the entire economy so what what exactly is the goal of the strike is it for better compensation or is it for well well, to be honest with you, I'm trying to explain this thing. I, I don't think many people understand what, why we are striking for. You know, your city, but also LAX especially, all the inflation, living costs is so expensive now. You know, tax is going up, gas is going up, food is going up the price, right? And the rent, it's impossible to live with a paycheck to paycheck. And the economy is not doing well, so not many places have the restaurant job anymore. It's not easy to survive. Wow. And the union thinks is that the Hollywood, 60 years ago, we went on the strike. At that time, we didn't have an internet or streaming service. Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, or Apple. So all time Hollywood. But at, at that time, they didn't have a health care, pension, retirement plan, or residual, residual system for the actors. So 60 years ago, we went on the strike to demand that we need to get our life to, you know, have a nice retirement life. And the studio were, were making so much money because they didn't pay for the residual. Once you use actor, pay for one time. No more. And they can run the movie forever. So they get all the money, right? Studio. But we didn't get paid for it. So 60 years ago, we changed the business model system that we need to be part of, compensated, get paid for what you guys make money, right? So this time, after 60 years, this streaming service, Netflix, Amazon, Apple, Disney uh, streaming service, you see so many famous shows, successful show on Netflix. But the reality is, especially during the pandemic, people were staying home. So they're watching Netflix all the time. So they made, um, how many billion dollars those studio streaming service with a subscription? Yeah. But actors, they somehow cheated on how many people watching because it's internet it's hard to count you know how many people watching because they don't want to share the information what they receive how many viewers are watching this show online yeah so a friend of mine i don't want to work for the netflix forever that's why i never had a bad experience a friend of mine was on the white lotus or famous many netflix show successful show he got paid one time just, uh, you know, when he worked on the set as actor, he got paid fair enough paycheck. After that, so many shows 
people watching he was in, he got paid only $20 a year for the research job. $20 That's a year? That's disrespect for our job. Now they're saying AI system, they're saying that once we pay, they pay to work on the set, they're going to scam our face and the voice, record it. They're going to use it forever, for free. And that's going to kill our job. So that's why we are fighting for this, for this uh, strike, because it's not only actors, it's going to kill a lot of different category or field of the business. Yes. For example, it's already happening. If you call the customer service, any company, you can go to the customer service, live person, talk to you, right? First, what you do is AI. What are you calling for? The robot voice. But it's somebody, somebody else's voice. They record it. And the computer detect what you are, what you want to do. Are you calling for the refill of the prescription? Say yes or no. They detect our voice. Robot sensor, right? That's all AI system. What happened to the customer service they used to do? Live people, they used to work for, you know, twelve dollars uh, one hour for the part time job, right? Answering the machine, answering the call. Now it's a, everything AI. The company they don't need to pay for it. They replace the people with a robot. AI in artificial intelligence. But if we don't stop or trying to explain the company, you can't just do that to other people for the greed, corporate greed for the profit. We have to keep the people working. We can't take the people job away just because of cost. So that's what's okay. happening. Yeah, it really seems that there could be a huge revolution in the oh, way. Oh yeah, so that that's I'm why talking. we really need to demand that this is going to change our future if we don't stand up now. That's why we decided to get on the strike. Otherwise, we don't want to get on the strike. We are losing a lot of money. We can't work. Of course. And it's not easy anymore to find a job in LA. A lot of restaurants, a lot of businesses are closing. It's not like a, 10 or 15 years ago in LA. It was easy to get the, all the waiter job, coffee shop job, anything. Now even Starbucks coffee are closing here. Even Bed Bath Beyond is closing here. A lot of famous restaurants is closing here. So it's not easy to survive for even actors or any people, young people too. So we don't want to get on the strike. But if we don't get on the strike, then corporate greed is going to take over our business. That's why we, 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 we made a really difficult decision uh, to get on the strike. Wow. Well, it's, it's going to exciting. happen to any kind of business. It's exciting, you know, to see, and while it does, it absolutely sucks, and it is corporate greed and capitalism um, really yeah. sickeningly uh, twisting everything as it does, but it really seems that there could be a, a really yeah. good revolution happening because of this. Well, Netflix, for example, Netflix CEO, last two years, he got paid $240 million salary a year. And then we are working like a rock to make a show behind scene to sell, right? We only get the 1% of the share from the company, residual or others. But a corporate CEO executive getting paid $240 million a year just because their corporate share. They don't share the profit with us, but we are the actual people making them rich. So that that doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. And um, yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, we could talk forever about how damaging 
capitalism is and how just it seems that the rich set themselves up in such a way to get richer and the poor get poorer and and uh yeah. you know it, it sounds like well, it's getting more and more impossible to even survive in los angeles as a a normal person well anyways that's what's happening yeah well i hope i hope that this results in some really beautiful change and and that actors and all all of the folks that make the industry possible and make the industry run get exactly yeah. what they need out of this cuz yeah you can't you can't ai somebody's voice if there's nobody's voice to be recorded you can't make 240 million dollars a year if there's no fucking shows being made It's, uh... I mean, it, it, tech, tech, technology-wise, I'm okay that they scan our face and use our voice, but not for free for forever. We we are part of the art, so if they really give us the you know residual or other way to pay us, that's fine because that's a new way, right? But you, what I what I'm trying to say is. People need to really respect other craftsmanship of the job of the human. If they really look into it, uh, AI whatsoever is fine. They can coexist. But the AI problem is they're trying to replace AI with a real human. That's not, that's not right. We have to still respect the way People do the job. The AI, they do the job, but they shouldn't cross. No, it's terrifying. But <laughs> um, I think we'll wrap up here. Um, is there anything else that you want to say? Anything that you would, anything that you would say to young actors getting started, or or uh, young Japanese I, folks making their way into into the I would system? say. If you really want to become actor, try 10 years and see how it works. Because I got to be honest with all people. If you realize that 30 years just trying to be actor, not making any appearance of the TV show or film and make a first paycheck or anything, I don't think that's a professional actor, but also I think that's too risky when you realize too late. It's so hard to go back and say, hey, you know, I wish I could be something else, you know, because we can't stop aging. Yeah. <laughs> so we have to set up the goal on time saying that, hey, well, let me try in Hollywood. Okay. If I, if I land, a TV co-star, guest star, probably I might be able to, you know, manage being actor. But still, it's difficult if you become a full-time actor like me. Still, you have to be proactive forever. And especially now, I'm late 40s. You know, I have to think about somehow retirement. How we're gonna, how we're gonna be comfortable in 20 years, right? So, in the way, young people, they need to think about uh, kind of a 10 years, 20 years, 30 years goal. What if it works? What if it doesn't work? Somehow you have to have that mentality because... Yeah, that's really otherwise smart. Otherwise, you, you ended up like a stuck being there. Yeah, that's really smart just to say, I'm going to give myself 10 years. I'm going to bust my ass on the scene and yeah. have some kind of backup plan if things don't pan out, just so you're not. Yeah. Uh... Well, sometimes people change their lifestyle because when they get married, have a kids, they focus on their family, right? So sometimes I see many actors when they're young, single, they try to do the old acting, but they have to make a living for the family. So, you know, they naturally shift to a different way of life too. So there are many 
we have to accept the change of life. That's it. We have to be flexible. Yeah, you never know when a historic strike is going to come through. Yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 I have to be there every day in the hot summer. One hour I have to walk in the sun. Well, you'll get a nice tan. Well, my skin is very sensitive, so I have to put a lot of sunscreen. Otherwise, I'm going to become like a, what do you call that, snake <laughs> when they change. Yeah, that the whole like skin is coming off, right? You remember <laughs> that? Um, I don't know if it is the right example or not, but I've seen that snake you know, changing the skin. Oh, wow. that's terrible. Yeah, you don't want to. Okay, you don't want to become a snake while bushes. you're being a part of the revolution. Yeah. Well, Kaz, thank you so much for being on with me today. Okay. I'm blessed by your uh, presence. My pleasure. So good to see you again on this oh. new iteration of Bowl and Brefix. I thank you so much, and uh, I'll be seeing you around. I'm proud of you, Jordan. Just stay a proactive. It's motherfucking bowl and breath fix.